Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be in attendance today. Just a couple of very brief housekeeping notes, if people would turn their mobile phones to silent, and also just to note that the proceedings are being streamed live today um, uh, and video recorded for use on the NHMRC website. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind people to join us for refreshments afterwards if they do have time. So a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Bruce Robinson. Um, I'm an endocrinologist, a, a researcher and a clinician at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney and, and the University of Sydney, and I'm also chair of the council of the NHMRC. It's great to see so many um, people from our research sector uh, here today for this very important occasion. As you all know, the NHMRC does play a critical role uh, in funding health and medical research in this country. And as the chair of the council since July 2015, uh, and, and as a researcher, as I've said myself, I'm also very cognizant of the outstanding research which is performed with the support of uh, the NHMRC, and likewise the research sector's expectations of the NHMRC and its grant program. Like any good organisation, of course, the NHMRC is always looking for ways of improving its systems and programs. And the structural review of the NHMRC's grant program has captured the interest of our health and medical research sector over the last 18 months. Um, we know that thousands of researchers around the country are, are eagerly awaiting uh, the announcement of the outcome of the review today. I might also take the opportunity of congratulating our CEO, um, Professor Anne Kelso, for the uh, in, uh, very, very valuable role that she had in initiating this review very early on in her time as CEO. It's now my great pleasure um, to introduce our Federal Minister for Health and Sport, the Honourable Greg Hunt, Minister Hunt, welcome, um, to make the announcement. Minister Hunt was appointed um, as the Minister for Health and Sport in January 2017, and before that, he was the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, also, of course, very relevant to our uh, health and medical research sector. We all very much appreciate, Minister, your commitment to health and medical research. Um, this is, uh, gives great heart to the researchers and clinicians around the country. So, Minister, welcome. Thanks very much to uh, Professor Bruce Robinson. Bruce, uh, you do an amazing job with uh, uh, with all of your different uh, hats and, uh, and roles, um, both as a clinician, as a researcher, as an administrator and as a reviewer. Um, if uh, one of the things that comes out of this is the capacity to clone more Bruce Robinsons, then that will be a very good, a very good outcome. Uh, to Anne Kelso, who is also one of our outstanding uh, scientific and uh, medical research leaders, and I think we are blessed to have Anne and her team, uh, team at the NH and MRC. Uh, Stephen Wessling, who's uh, from SAMRI and who has helped lead this process of the review. It has been a review of the work of the NH and MRC uh, by the medical community and for the medical community. Uh, and then, of course, I look around and I see so many people uh, of extraordinary capacity. Um, including uh, the great Ian Fraser, who is the chair of the Medical Research Future Fund, um, and people from Monash University, such as Christina Mitchell, uh, Andrew Holmes from the Academy, and all of you. It is a, uh, a galaxy of medical researchers. I think that's the appropriate collective, uh, collective noun for this group. I, I wanted to deal very briefly with three things, because today is, is Anne's... Uh, show for her to outline the changes that the research community has itself proposed and agreed upon and which have been accepted in full and unchanged by the government. So it's Anne's uh, role to outline the platform that she and the community have agreed upon and which we have supported uh, to take our medical research from being, I think, right at the uh, world's cutting edge to being the best in the world. I think the vision is that we can be the world's best medical research nation. It's as clear and as simple as that. It's a tough goal, but it's an achievable goal. 
So the three things I want to deal with very briefly are, firstly, Australia and medical research, secondly, medical research and the uh, long-term national health plan, and thirdly, uh, a brief outline of the nature of the changes for the new NH and MRC research program grants. Now, when we look back at the history of medical research in Australia, uh, we run through the, the list of, uh, of names in the Pantheon from people such as uh, Howard Florey to McFarlane Burnett and uh, what McFarlane Burnett and Florey did in terms of bringing treatment uh, through, the, uh, through the mass production and the accessibility of penicillin and then uh, immunotherapy and uh, immunisation. Extraordinary, not just Australian changing events, but world-changing events. There are literally uh, tens and tens of millions of people whose lives have been saved by their work and others such as them. And you travel forward uh, through Gustav Nossel uh, to Ian Fraser himself, who's here with his extraordinary work uh, for women's health, um, which has gone right around the world. Uh, and then our great uh, female leaders such as Elizabeth Blackburn, the Nobel Laureate, uh, Fiona Wood and Fiona Stanley. It's an incredible tradition of medical research which uh, does a number of things. Uh, of course, it saves lives and extends lives above all else. Uh, it also attracts to Australia some of the world's best researchers. Uh, it attracts uh, industry and pharmaceutical development. It creates employment. And in terms of employment, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. The work that we did in innovation and science uh, produced the results that employment growth in our hospital and university precincts is about two and a quarter times that of the national average. So it's a service sector with the best of human outcomes, but also the most profound of economic outcomes in terms of uh, of opportunity and prosperity for the country. So on every front, what you do is extraordinary. Then that brings me to where medical research fits within the long-term national health plan. It is one of our four great pillars. And those pillars are the guaranteeing and strengthening Medicare and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. And we were fortunate to strike really landmark partnerships with the AMA and the College of GPs, uh, with the uh, Medicines Australia representing the pharmaceutical sector with the Pharmacy Guild and the generic and bio, uh, bio uh, similars, uh, bi uh, generic and bi uh, biosimilar medicines association to give us a platform to reinvest in those sectors and to contribute, I think, approximately 2.4 and 2.2 billion dollars going forward to uh, Medicare and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. That's what we should be doing. But the fact that we were able to strike the agreements puts us in a position to do real long-term reform and reinvestment work with the sector. Similarly, the second of our pillars is uh, supporting our hospital system, and that's the combination of the public, the private, and the private health insurance together. You bring all of those things in, and we have, I, I think, a system which is the best system for Australia but arguably, uh, when you look at the different models around the world, uh, a model which is a beacon to the rest of the world. So we have an outstanding health system. There are always challenges, uh, but I think we would be making a mistake if we don't acknowledge that. And being able to reinvest additional funds, an additional $2.8 in this budget, was an important contribution. The third of the pillars is uh, mental health and preventive health. Preventive health is such a critical part of quality of life, but also building the sustainability of the system so as we can move from the notional avoidable hospital admissions to the avoided hospital admissions with the savings for the system, but most importantly, the quality of life outcomes for people around the country. And as part of that, the mental health uh, challenge is something we just simply have to acknowledge with four million Australians a year facing some form of, uh, uh, of chronic or acute mental health uh, condition, uh, then what we see is that virtually every family is touched. And our task now is not just to provide the structure, which we're doing with the additional psychosocial services, but 
importantly, to move it from being destigmatized, which is basically saying, I understand and I'm not judging you, to being normalized where people are willing to say, I have these challenges myself. That's really what the normalization path is. But then the fourth of the pillars is medical research. And uh, this is just a deep personal passion. I see the work, uh, whether it's uh, the things that, uh, that I've seen at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, the work of, uh, of Catherine North and her extraordinary team uh, of visiting uh, the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital last week. And we saw the post-cardiac care unit for those that had had uh, major operations and the clinical trials which were being undertaken in relation to the use of aspirin and, uh, and other related drugs and how this could produce better outcomes in conjunction with major surgery. But in particular, what struck me was the work in the intensive care unit in the neonatal ward. So the most premature, the most vulnerable of all of the, uh, the little babies were being treated with uh, a new level of oxygen saturation, which was producing better outcomes for those at simply the most vulnerable point of existence we could possibly imagine. And uh, I came away confirmed in my thinking that the definition of society is in the intensive care unit of a neonatal ward in one of our major public hospitals, that your work brought together in real time, in real life. And when you meet the parents and you see these babies, you know that you're doing great work. Uh, now, whether it's any of those areas, this medical research is fundamental. So the NH and MRC is the foundation stone of our research work. We have complemented that with the pathway to a doubling of medical research funding that we're now well and truly on track with, with the Medical Research Future Fund. Um, we've just announced uh, $65 million of funding for this round, but then that extends out to $120 million, $220 million, $380 million, and the $640 million that we've added this year. So we are on track to double our medical uh, research funding in Australia. The third part of the medical research funding equation uh, is of course the biomedical translation fund to take what's being done in the lab and to bring it to the lounge. And what that does is it gives people the ability to commercialise and to have a pathway to translate, which means for a researcher your work ends up affecting real lives. And uh, that's, that couldn't be a more exciting pathway. All of that brings me to the changes today. I want to say a little bit about the process. The process uh, has been exhaustive and comprehensive. It has been led by the NH and MRC in conjunction with the research community. So uh, Stephen uh, Wesseling here from SAMRI has been the chair uh, and he's done a tremendous job. I'm delighted that we were able to support the work of, uh, of SAMRI with Australia's first uh, proton Beam Therapy uh, Research and Treatment Centre, which was entirely unrelated to your role as chair, I just want to, want to add. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's an investment which has been a deep personal passion shared by, shared by both of us. It was just a coincidence. Uh, but uh, let me say that's the first of what I hope will be a number of such units around the country of helping, you know, beautiful children and others with, with brain cancer and what had previously been incurable or untreatable conditions. But Stephen's leadership, but then uh, a distinguished panel, uh, including people such as uh, Doug, Professor Doug Hilton from uh, the great Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, Catherine North, whom I mentioned, and so many others uh, who are contributing. So it's been a researcher and a medical research community-led process. All of that uh, leads to the outcomes. So essentially the changes can be summarised as one, moving to simplify the process so there is less bureaucracy, at less time uh, spent in filling out the exhaustive process. We'll still maintain the high standards under Anne and her team but they believe it can be done much more simply. Two, longer term grants, uh, a big focus on five year grants which gives people the security to pursue real research 
uh, which is groundbreaking. And three, to be innovative. And so what we really want to support is innovation in medical research. And these types of changes are the things which will allow it. Essentially, they come into four different grants. Uh, we have, uh, firstly, the IDEAS grants. And the IDEAS grants will be focusing especially um, on research projects that are addressing a very specific question. And they'll be for up to five years, and Anne will provide more details on, on each of these, and about 25% of the field. Secondly, the investigator grants. And the investigator grants are to support the research programs of outstanding investigators at all career stages. In particular, what we want to do is to, be allow, is to allow more clinician involvement. So the ability of people to be both, you know, as, as is Bruce, uh, hybrid uh, researchers and clinicians. And we saw that at Royal Prince Alfred, and I think that that's extremely important. That will be approximately 40% of the grants. Thirdly, uh, the new category of synergy grants. These are to support outstanding multidisciplinary teams of investigators to work together. There'll be grants of, uh, uh, of up to $5 million, and uh, that's about 5% of the, uh, the overall value. And fourthly, the strategic or leveraging grants, and these are to support research that addresses identified deep fundamental national needs, and that will be about 30% of the overall grant allocation. These are the ideas that have come, have been tested thoroughly, and uh, represent the views of the medical research community. There'll never be 100% agreement, but I think uh, you know Bruce and Anne, Stephen and your teams, you've done an outstanding job. Um, you have laid a foundation for the next wave of innovative medical research in Australia. I want to thank you, uh, honour you, and congratulate you. Minister, thank you very much for your enthusiastic support of medical research, um, not just this process, but also uh, NHMRC, the Medical Research Future Fund, uh, the Biotechnology Fund as well. These have been great initiatives of the government and I know are well supported by yourself. As you said, um, medical research does contribute not only to the health of people in Australia, but internationally. Uh, many of the discoveries in Australia have been translated into vastly improved health outcomes for people around the world, and I think it's important that we play our role in that regard. You also pointed out, of course, that these, um, the health and medical research in Australia has a very important economic contribution to make to the, money, uh, to the country too, and I think that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of either. Um, today, though, is really um, Anne's day. Um, Anne has been a very capable CEO of the NHMRC and has shown great leadership in initiating this review. Um, as I said earlier, it was initiated very early on in her tenure as CEO, and Anne, we really do look forward to, uh, and I speak as a researcher here today, as uh, many of us do look forward to your uh, more detailed discussion today of what is proposed in the review. So, Anne, thank you. Well, thank you, Bruce and uh, Minister Hunt, distinguished uh, colleagues and friends. It's fantastic to see you here today and I thank you very much indeed for coming. And I thank all the people who I hope are able to watch us uh, through live streaming and will be paying attention, I expect, over this, uh, these coming minutes. Um, thank you, Minister, also for your support of our reforms. Uh, we really appreciate that uh, you have expressed such strong support and we also appreciate your willingness to join us here for today for the launch and in fact do the launch it's, it's really we really appreciate that commitment that you have to medical research and also to the work that we've been doing so uh, i think also when i look around the room i know your remarks will have been very warmly received by everybody here the support is gratefully um, received so NHMRC turned 80 this year. It dispersed its first grants in 1937. Everyone who applied got one. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, amongst, the, amongst those uh, researchers were two who went on to win Nobel Prizes in physiology or medicine, Sir Mac Burnett uh, and Sir John Eccles in 1960 and 1963, respectively. And of course, others have followed. Um, but Nobel Prizes are just the peak of the mountain for research, and over the decades, NHMRC has supported a truly extraordinary range of excellent research that's led to 
deeper understanding of the basis of human health and disease, uh, new vaccines like Gardasil and uh, drugs and diagnostics, uh, improvements in clinical care and health services, and successful public health interventions, which we almost don't notice. They're part of the background now for us. But this is the important preventive health that the minister has mentioned. And all of these have contributed to the very high standard of health and well-being that we all experience today. So I think it's also important to remember that Australian researchers are part of a global research endeavour. So uh, they link us to a whole world of international research and translation, and that ensures that we can learn from, build on, and contribute to advances that are made all around the world. So we've all benefited on, from the Australian public's investment in health and medical research through NHMRC. So NHMRC, I think, has served the nation very well over a long time, uh, but times and circumstances change, and we've seen a massive increase in competition for research funding over these last years. So when I, uh, when I joined NHMRC just uh, two years ago, I was confronted with the fact that you can see at the right hand of the slide there that we were uh, facing the lowest ever uh, success rate for applications to our project grant scheme, which is our biggest scheme at the moment. It's 50% of the medical research endowment account which is expended on this single scheme. So in 2015, our success rate dropped to below 14%. Last year, it was just over 15%. So that means we have a huge number of, uh, in fact, excellent grants which can't be funded. And of course, research costs are rising year in, year out. And so as you can see from the green bars there, we're actually only able to fund fewer project grants today than we could even five years ago. So you could ask why this matters. Isn't competition good? Isn't this what makes a research sector strong? And yes, but only up to a point. I think this level of competition that we experience now means a lot of very good research is not being funded. Researchers are spending months every year preparing their proposals with a low chance of success overall. Many early and mid-career researchers are telling us that they're thinking about leaving and looking for other types of career because they're worried they won't even get a foot in the door when it's so hard to get a project grant or a fellowship. And applicants are becoming, uh, we believe, more risk averse in this hyper competitive situation, more risk averse about pursuing new ideas or changing fields. I don't think this is good for the future of research in our country. When I uh, came to NHMRC in 2015, there was a myriad of suggestions about what we could do to fix this. Uh, and we realised then that uh, it wasn't a matter of just tweaking at the edges of our current uh, system. We needed to step back and take an overall look at the program and see how we could uh, more holistically address the problems. So, as you know and as you've heard, uh, we've um, undertaken a review of the structure of NHMRC's grant program and developed a new structure. And critical to this process, as the Minister has also acknowledged, has been the uh, expert advisory group um, appointed to help us with this review. Now, it's been shared, as we've heard by Steve Westling, who's here today, with several other members of the expert advisory group. And these have been uh, uh, outstanding researchers and research administrators, and also an outstanding consumer representative, uh, Christine Gunson, who I'm delighted has been able to come today as well. So with the expert advisory group, we undertook a consultation uh, last year uh, with public forums around the country attended by more than 1,000 people, 329 written submissions with lots of different opinions expressed. Uh, based on this advice, the expert advisory group developed a draft new structure. And then early this year, we took that draft structure to target a consultation with many different stakeholder groups and groups of uh, um, researchers, some of whom are represented uh, in this room today. Uh, and that gave us a lot of further feedback on, on how this was uh, narrowing down to a, an important new and workable model. So throughout that whole process as well, we had uh, fantastic advice from our principal committees, especially uh, research committee, and from our council chaired, as you know, by Bruce Robinson. Finally, in March this year, the council recommended that we proceed with the new grant program that we're launching today. And since then, we've been extremely grateful to uh, receive the support of the minister and a number of peak bodies with whom we've been discussing the final version uh, over these um, last days and weeks. 
So now I want to provide you with some more detail on the key aspects of the program that the Minister has already summarised. And my first, uh, I want to start by just uh, a few words about our current program so that those who aren't deeply embedded in this can understand the changes. So first of all, our current program is shown here in four streams. Scholarships and fellowships, which provide salaries for outstanding investigators. Program grants, which provide large five-year grants for teams. Project grants, which I've already mentioned, uh, which um, fund specific research projects. And then various strategic and leveraging grants, which are listed at the bottom there. But they include our very successful centres of research excellence, uh, development grants, partnership centres, and targeted calls for research, and a variety of international collaborative schemes. And then the allocation of the funds across these four streams is shown here. Uh, the biggest slice to project grants and then uh, significant slices to those three other streams, as you can see. Now, our objectives in undertaking the, the major reform that we're now introducing are shown here. And the first is to promote creativity and innovation across every field of health and medical research. The second is to provide opportunities for talented researchers at all career stages, including, and perhaps I should say especially, uh, early and mid-career researchers who are our future, of course. And uh, thirdly, to minimise the burden on researchers of excessive applications and peer review, which frees a lot of time for research. So how can we do this? How do we support the most creative research? How can we provide researchers with the stability that they need so they can follow their most promising leads to solve whatever is the complex problem they're addressing or whatever is the disease that they want to make a difference to? How do we foster collaboration, whether it's those long-term, deep partnerships that address the really big challenges over time, or the more transient collaborations that are needed to solve a particular technical problem? And how do we achieve all of this in a more streamlined program that doesn't drive researchers to submit more and more applications which we won't be able to fund. So the approach that the expert advisory group uh, recommended um, was, uh, and which has then been refined over many months of discussion, sets out to achieve the objectives uh, with several integrated components. And uh, I will go into more detail about these shortly, uh, but um, I'll just give a brief overview, first of all, of the thinking behind uh, this structure. So the first point is the consolidation of funding for high-performing researchers at all career stages with a grant that provides their salary if they need it and a single substantial research support package. This is the investigator grant, and I'll describe more about that in a minute. The second is a big incentive to bring together diverse teams of those high-performing researchers, uh, wherever they are in the sector, um, to address a major question or challenge. And this is the Synergy Grant. Now, an important point is that the Investigator Grant and the Synergy Grants will be awarded primarily on the research track record of the investigators. So this is about investing in people uh, who've already shown outstanding achievement and promise and giving them the stable funding that they need to tackle the really big issues in health and biomedicine. The third component of the strategy is the creation of a scheme that focuses on new ideas and innovative approaches, and this is the Ideas Grant Scheme. These grants will be awarded primarily on the science, the significance and the innovation of the proposal. And then the final component of the strategy, uh, which is not articulated on the slide, is the limiting or capping of the numbers of applications researchers can submit and the numbers of grants they can hold across those first three streams of investigator synergy and ideas grants. And then retention and enhancement of the strategic and leveraging grants stream is the fourth part of this um, uh, overview, and that ensures that we continue to support strategic research through the very successful uh, CREs, development grants, partnership projects, and other schemes. We're also developing a new scheme for clinical trials and cohort studies, which, we're current, which are currently funded through project grants, and they'll be included in the strategic and leveraging grants stream. So the new program reflects the philosophy that's um, articulated here, and that is that health and medical research is best supported by a diversified portfolio of schemes that fund across the spectrum of health and medical research, that invest in people with outstanding research achievement and promise, that support the most 
innovative research to solve complex problems, and also has the flexibility to meet specific strategic objectives and priorities as they arise. So I want to go into more detail now, and I'll just have this slide up while I tell you quite a lot of the detail um, about these um, four streams, particularly the first three. And uh, the website will go live soon, I hope, uh, which will um, capture this detail and you'll be able to refer to it later because it's not all written out on the slides. So let's start with investigator grants, five-year grants. And these provide salary equivalent to our current fellowships, so going across the whole range of career stages. Uh, but in addition, all postdoctoral and senior fellows across that whole postdoctoral um, range will receive a research support package. Postgraduate scholarships will continue to be provided as now, but won't get the research support package, so they will remain as now. Now, the size of the research support package will be determined through peer review based on the track record of the investigator. Track records will be evaluated relative to career stage and opportunities, so in fact, the largest research packages won't automatically go to the most senior researchers. Researchers may also apply for an investigator grant without a salary. Uh, for example, if they're supported by a non-NHMRC fellowship or they have a, an academic or a clinical appointment that pays their salary from their institution, they can still apply for a package of funding but just without the salary. And also, the investigator grants can be provided with a part-time salary but a full-time package for those people who, for personal or for professional reasons, uh, work part-time on their research but can nevertheless uh, manage a team which continue, can continue to power ahead while they're taking uh, uh, time out, might be to look after um, children, for example, and can continue their research careers at, at, as full pace as is possible. Now, the big advantage of the investigator grant scheme is the flexibility and the stability uh, that that provides to the researcher. The researcher can use the research support package to support a team of postdoctoral and other researchers, as well as to support consumables and services they need for the research. They can collaborate freely within Australia or internationally in whatever way best helps them to achieve their research goals. And they can take a programmatic approach to their research uh, rather than dividing it up into small projects for separate funding applications. So unlike our current program, fellows or investigators will be relieved of applying for multiple project grants to support their work. Now the Synergy grants are uh, a fixed value $5 million grant to enable synergy that happens when you bring diverse multidisciplinary researchers together to answer a big question. Now, it's really important to understand that these uh, grants will be provided on top of whatever other grants the researcher holds. And so uh, that means that um, uh, an investigator, somebody who has an investigator grant or somebody who has uh, an ideas grant can be a member of a Synergy grant team and share in that boost, that incentive of an extra $5 million Synergy grant uh, to their, co their collaborative research effort. Uh, that means that CIs don't need to relinquish any funding when they join a Synergy Grant team. And again, that grant can be used to employ research staff or biomaterials, just whatever's needed to achieve the best possible outcome from the collaboration. So these grants are meant to be a real incentive for outstanding researchers to work together. The peer review process will uh, encourage diversity in the makeup of teams, and because of the way track records will be evaluated, we want it to be possible, for example, for a team of mid-career researchers to get a synergy grant uh, without having a senior researcher on their team. <clears throat> Ideas grants, the third stream, now these will be available to, career, to researchers at all career stages and they'll provide important support for emerging researchers who are doing great science, have great ideas, but don't yet have a track record that would make them competitive for an investigator grant. These grants will be awarded primarily on the science, the significance and the innovation of the research proposal. And then the second consideration for their award will be the feasibility of the, pro of the project, and that'll take into account um, track record of the investigators. Like the other schemes, <clears throat> ideas grants will be awarded across the whole spectrum of health and medical research. So this is not just about discovery ideas at the bench, it's from biomedical discovery through clinical research, health services, population and public health. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Now the focus on the science and the idea uh, ahead of track record is really a key feature of the Ideas Grant scheme and I think this will counteract the trend for people to put the most senior investigator on current um, project grant applications, for example, as the CIA at the expense of early and mid-career researchers. And this will explicitly, this uh, scheme will explicitly encourage fresh thinking and innovation. So then finally, the strategic and leveraging grants. This includes the CREs, development grants, etc., as, as I've said. It also includes the current equipment uh, grant scheme and IRIS, the Independent Research Institute Infrastructure Support Scheme. The new grant program will include an enhanced targeted calls for research uh, scheme, which we've been developing and implementing over the last year. It will also include the new clinical trials and cohort studies scheme, which I mentioned, which we're developing, for which we're developing a new assessment and monitoring framework at the moment in consultation with the clinical trials sector. Now, a critical slide uh, for applicants is this um, uh, slide about the capping of applicants to the first three streams here. So this is a significant um, uh, change from our current very open um, system. Individuals uh, for the capping first, capping of applications in the first row, you'll see a number of combinations there. Each row is a combination. So first, individuals can apply for any two grants across those three integrated streams of investigator synergy and ideas grants in any one round. For example, you could have one investigator and one synergy grant application, or one investigator and one ideas grant application, or one ideas and one synergy grant application, or two ideas at the same, in the same round. Then if we look at the capping of grants held, individuals may hold any two, or in some circumstance, three grants across the three streams, but with some restrictions. So an investigator grant can be held with a synergy grant, but an investigator grant cannot be held with an ideas grant. The whole point here is to give the investigator a package that they can go away and do the best they can with and leave the ideas grant scheme for a different purpose and a different group of researchers. Researchers can hold two ideas grants concurrently and we want those sorts of researchers also to have the opportunity to be part of a synergy grant team and so for that reason we break down our two uh, cap rule uh, to make it a three uh, grants held rule for ideas grant holders who are part of synergy grant teams. So that's the only combination uh, where someone can hold three grants. Importantly, these uh, capping rules don't affect access to the schemes in the strategic and leveraging grants uh, stream, and that's particularly important if you think about the way clinical trialists work. A clinical trials scheme won't be capped in this respect, and we have many people who would be working across multiple trials, and we don't want to interfere with that. So these components will all work together to achieve the objectives of the reform, and in a way we can't pull those apart with, and still expect what, to achieve what we are setting out to do. In fact, it was suggested by uh, one member of NHMRC Council that these changes could save researchers a month a year writing applications. So that will be a big uh, gain in itself. So uh, if we compare the distribution of funds um, between the uh, current and the, old, and the new program, you can see here that uh, uh, the 50% of funds that were uh, currently allocated to project grants are redistributed between investigator grants to fund the research support packages, ideas grants, and the new clinical trials and cohort studies scheme, which is now added to the fourth uh, strategic and leveraging grant stream. <laughs> investigator grants take up 40% of the MREA, it's a big slice, because they include both the salaries currently provided through fellowships and the research support packages that would otherwise mostly have been funded through the project uh, grant scheme. And synergy grants make up the balance at about 50 million. We're imagining delivering 10 $5 million synergy grants per year, uh, um, much the same as we do uh, for program grants at the moment. So quite a number of things won't change, and that's uh, important because it really reflects some very important uh, philosophies underpinning uh, NHMRC's um, approach. First is that research excellence determined by expert independent peer review is the basis for allocating funding now and forever. Uh, continue commitment of at least 5% of the MREA annually to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. Uh, support for research across all of the um, broad research areas, basic clinical public health and health services. 
support for partnerships with end users, support for commercialization, for translation and for implementation science, and support for a diversity of researchers, uh, whether we talk about gender, full-time or part-time researchers, or those with career breaks, as well as those from different disciplines. Now, the timing of implementation is another critical piece of information. On the left there, you can see the day we have finally reached, 25th of May, 2017. It's a milestone for us. Uh, but uh, you'll be interested to see that from uh, late this year, for the next funding round, we intend to uh, introduce some caps uh, to the current project grants round scheme as a, uh, to ease the transition to the caps that are coming um, with the total uh, um, implementation of the new program from late 2018. So the full program will be implemented with applications that are begin preparation in late 2018 for submission and peer review in 2019 and for the commencement of funding in 2020. Uh, for those uh, who currently have NHMRC funding, uh, and they'll be particularly concerned about the transition arrangements, there's a lot of work going on at the moment in the office about um, the, the, the really fine details of this. But it's important to know it'll be a stage transition, uh, and it's going to be framed by a couple of principles. First of all, equity and fairness and no disadvantage through the changeover. And what that means in practice is that all existing grants will continue until their planned conclusion. So anything that's already been awarded, it's gone through peer review, we're not going to terminate any of those grants prematurely to uh, force anyone to transition uh, before um, that work has had a chance to be completed. So uh, in conclusion, NHMRC I think has a stewardship role in supporting research activity and capability across the full spectrum of Australian health and medical research needs. Continuing support for a broad range of research fields and researchers is especially important at this time. There's a lot of discussion about research priorities, new opportunities through the Medical Research Future Fund. And those discussions are happening across government and across the community. The reforms we are announcing today are to the overarching structure of uh, the way we fund through our grant program, and they are intended to support more efficient and effective funding of research across all fields, whether the focus is on bench science or health systems, whether it's on cardiovascular disease or mental health, whether it's on rare diseases or those causing the heaviest burden, and uh, whether it's in fields where Australia is already strong or those where we need to invest more. We must ensure we fund research on the problems of today, as well as have the capability, the readiness to make the discoveries and address the problems of the future, including those that we can't yet imagine. The new NHMRC program introduces, I think, very important reforms to the way we fund research that will strengthen the whole of the Australia's health and medical research endeavour. Uh, I personally, we at NHMRC are very excited to be presenting this new program and uh, to you today in this room and to the wider health and medical research sector who are somewhere out there, I hope. Uh, and we look forward to working with you all over the coming months and years to make it a success. My deepest thanks go to the expert advisory group, our committees and council, the many people who've engaged in discussion over the last 18 months, and finally to our fantastic NHMRC staff for your commitment to a very substantial body of work. So thank you all for your support through this first stage of the journey.